I'm Angela Stent. I'm director of the Center for Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies here in the School of Foreign Service. And I would like to welcome you to our conference today on the South Caucasus and Iran, New Regional Dimensions. Uh, Dean Carol Lancaster, who was going to welcome you, um, was called away. So I'm going to do the welcome and just um, outline some of the themes that I hope we'll be talking about today. Um, the conference is taking place at a time of renewed interest in the region, as we all know. Uh, the recent elections in Azerbaijan and Georgia uh, suggest possible new directions for the South Caucasus region. Uh, with the 2014 NATO withdrawal from Afghanistan um, looming, uh, there are many questions about the future of the Western presence in the region and about the future of the region itself. How sustainable uh, will the US and other NATO countries' interest in uh, the Caspian and South Caucasus region be as we move further away from the withdrawal from Afghanistan? Uh, then, of course, there is the um, attempt, the initiative uh, by the U.S. to engage in a dialogue with the election of uh, the new Iranian president, Rouhani, and questions about uh, whether that will succeed and the challenges involved in that kind of a dialogue that will also have a major impact or could have a major impact on the region. Um, and, of course, both the developments in the South Caucasus itself and this initiative now between the U.S. and Iran also has major implications for U.S.-Russian relations, or could as we move into the future. Uh, we often think about Iran as a Middle Eastern state, um, but uh, Iran shares half of its borders uh, with states in the Caucasus and Central Asia. We have our map up there uh, with Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Turkmenistan. And of course, Iran also shares ethnic ties uh, with many of these bordering states. Uh, about a third of the population of Iran is ethnic Azerbaijani. Uh, some of the top leaders are also ethnically um, Azerbaijani. Um, and a large po uh, pr uh, part of the population of Mashhad, the major shrine in Iran, is ethnic Turkmen. So again, you have this very interesting and complicated ethnic mix in the region. Uh, U.S. allies bordering the region, such as Saudi Arabia and, uh, and Azerbaijan, have expressed concern uh, that Washington's new relationship with Tehran uh, might have detrimental effects on them, for instance, if the sanctions regime were lifted, and that's just a hypothetical were, and I know we're going to hear much more about that, and if they themselves then moved away from the sanctions regime, that they could be punished by her, um, Iran for having um, adhered to it for so many years. So this is um, also a, ma a major question for the states in the region. So we're hoping to initiate this discussion at our conference on Iran um, and the South Caucasus, the developments there, and the implications for the wider region, um, and of course also for U.S. energy and security interests in the region. We have a very distinguished group of speakers whom you will, I'm sure, enjoy listening to. Um, and I'm now going to introduce our first keynote speaker, Professor Svante Cornell from Johns, Johns Hopkins SAIS. Uh, Professor Cornell is Research Director of the Central Asia Caucasus Institute and Silk Road Studies Program. He's a co-founder of the Institute for Security and Development Policy uh, in Stockholm, and his main areas of expertise are security issues, state building, and transnational crime in Southwest and Central Asia with specific focus on the Caucasus and also on Turkey. Uh, and he's the editor of Central Asia Caucasus Analyst, the Joint Center's bi-weekly publication and the Joint Center's Silk Road Papers, a series of occasional papers on this region. He is a prolific author. If I read to you all of his publications, we'd be here for another 15 minutes. Um, but um, his latest, uh, one of his latest books is Small Nations and Great Powers, the first comprehensive study of the post-Soviet um, uh, of post-Soviet conflicts in the South Caucasus. Uh, he holds a PhD in Peace and Conflict Studies from Uppsala University, a BSc in International Relations from the Middle East Technical University in Ankara, Turkey, um, and various honorary degrees from different uh, universities in the region. So we're delighted to welcome you here today. Um, thank you very much for your kind introduction and for uh, for inviting me to speak here. 
It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here at Georgetown. Um, I, um, I've been asked, at least the way it looks in the program, to speak not so much about Iran, but to kind of provide a context for the discussion of the, the South Caucasus today. And in fact, in doing so, I'm actually going to take a, a step back and speak about first how we, how we perceive the South Caucasus and, and how the U.S. over time has related to the South Caucasus before saying a few words about the challenges that the region faces today um, and how we should, uh, and, I, and some words about how I believe we should address them. Um, and I, in, as a starting point, I think, uh, there was, uh, there's been from the 1990s, from the early 1990s in fact, a, a bipartisan policy that developed uh, in the United States that um, did several things. It first identified the uh, South Caucasus as well as Central Asia as regions to begin with and as regions in their own right uh, where America had defined interests. Uh, and second, this policy also took as its starting point uh, the support for the independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity of the countries of the South Caucasus and Central Asia. Uh, and in fact, you started to see, uh, from the Clinton administration especially onwards, the uh, policies that, that were implemented to support the independence of these countries. Um, one of the key elements of this policy, I think, was to understand that the, uh, to understand the importance of the ability of these countries to market, or the region if you will, to market its most valuable commodities, um, its most valuable resources independently of any other major power, especially the, the power that was a former colonial overlord, that, that is Russia. And what I'm talking about, of course, is the energy resources of the region. And second, I think there was also an understanding uh, that even if territorial conflicts between these countries or within these countries had ar arisen if you will, locally, they had over time become instruments for external powers to pressure these countries and to prevent them from, from developing contacts with the West or a pro-Western foreign policy. Uh, and again, I think it's important to state that this was not a left or right policy, this was not a Republican or a Democratic policy, it started in the first President Bush, but the real heavy lifting uh, was done under the Clinton administration. Um, and it involved support not only by the executive branch, by, but also by Congress, uh, for example, by the Silk Road Act, which was passed in 1998. Um, and I would say that the events of September 11 boosted this policy for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, because the quality and the degree of the response uh, that the, the states in the region provided to the U.S. needs for cooperation and assistance uh, turned out to be directly related to their levels of independence. In other words, um, the way that the states were willing to respond to U.S. needs uh, for assistance was inversely related to the degree to which they had to call Moscow and ask for permission for take before taking any ind independent steps in their foreign policy. Um, and therefore, what you saw was that countries such as Georgia, Azerbaijan, Ukraine, and Uzbekistan, the most independent states in the post-Soviet sphere, were also the most forthcoming in terms of, uh, uh, in, in terms of assisting the United States in, their, in its efforts uh, to prosecute the war in Afghanistan. We all know what happened later, which is, of course, that starting with the war in Iraq, the attention of the U.S. administration began to be diverted. Uh, and by uh, 2008, even the Georgia War, which refocused for a moment uh, the world's and the U.S. attention on the region, was very rapidly overshadowed only a few weeks later by the onset of the world financial crisis. Now, um, I'm saying this in, 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 in way of a background because it seems to me that in the past four to five years, U.S. policy has not seemed to be equally motivated by these notions that I've just outlined for you. Uh, now, understandably, of course, the uh, U.S. policy or the attention of the U.S. policymakers in the past several years has been focused quite inward. And the president speaks very often, and rightly so, about the need for nation building at home rather than abroad. Uh, it also seems to me that there is less of a focus on Europe as a whole, uh, to which, of course, the South Caucasus is the easternmost most, uh, part, of which uh, the South Caucasus is the easternmost part. And I think partly this is because Europe is seen, if you will, as a finished job, something that was taken care of where uh, the U.S. no longer needs to exercise the same amount of leadership that, has, that had been the case. And of course, thirdly, we know that the, uh, the U.S., uh, one of the main foreign policy initiatives of this uh, administration has been the reset with Russia. Now, it's clear, uh, and it was clear from the beginning, and it was clearly stated, 
that this reset with Russia was, not, was designed specifically not to be at the expense of the other states of the former Soviet Union. In reality, it has been, I would argue. Um, and it has been for several reasons. One, I think, is timing. Uh, and you know, the, the reset was launched directly after President Medvedev of Russia then, uh, um, fresh after invading Georgia in September 2008, uh, publicly stated the uh, Russia's demand for a privileged sphere of, uh, in, a sphere of privileged interest, the way he put it. In other words, a sphere of influence over the former Soviet states, but not only, as he put it. Um, and that claim, by the way, was repeated by President Medvedev in Washington in November 2008 at, a, at, a, at an event at the Council on Foreign Relations. And the reset, of course, came freshly after that. And I would argue that there was one official in the U.S. government that repeatedly and strongly mentioned and stated the opposition of the United States to a Russian sphere, or the notion of a Russian sphere, or anybody's sphere of influence. And that was the Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. She did so repeatedly in various speeches and in various comments. But to my knowledge, she was the only real senior official to do so. Um, President Obama, to my knowledge, has not certainly has not been making this a point in his, uh, in his comment, public comments. The National Security Council has not been vocal on this issue. Uh, the new Secretary of State, John Kerry, has not similarly been speaking about this issue, to my knowledge. If I'm, uh, if I'm mistaken about this, I would be happy to be corrected. Um, and what you see on the other side in Russia is that Russian officials and Russian commentators, privately and sometimes even publicly, will say that their understanding is that the Obama administration has tacitly accepted the notion of a Russian sphere of influence in the former Soviet states. And it has done so while, of course, not acknowledging, acknowledging that publicly, but by downplaying America's interest in the former Soviet Union and by not really taking strong initiatives in the region that would potentially, as the term is very often put, irritate Russia. Uh, in addition to that, I think that's one of the, one of the problems we've seen over the past years. Um, Another problem, I think, is the sense, uh, if you look at U.S. policy, that the U.S. government has tended less and less to see the South Caucasus, and for that matter, Central Asia, as regions in their own right. But it's, and it seems to me that they have, the countries of the region have become increasingly compartmentalized, if you will. Um, in so this has happened in several ways. One way in which it has happened, and to quote one official um, from the policy planning staff that spoke at a conference some years ago, he said, we will work with the big states on the big issues. And that suggests an, an emphasis on relating to big powers and a lesser emphasis on preserving and advancing America's relationship with small allies in the region, such as the countries we're talking about. And secondly, it seems to me that the, uh, the states of the Caucasus in Central Asia have been seen in a way as appendices uh, to Russia policy or to Afghanistan policy, rather than, than, than as an area in its own right where the U.S. has clear and defined interests. And in, in my view, that explains, if you will, the failure of the single real U.S. initiative in the Caucasus in the past five years, which, has been the, was, which was a Turkish-Armenian rapprochement, which of course was strongly uh, supported by the White House. Um, that policy sought to de-link, of course, the Turkish-Armenian relationship from the Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict. Now, we don't even have to go into whether that's a good idea or not. The problem with that policy was that it didn't work. And it did not work because it tried to lift Armenia and Turkey out of the regional context in which they are. And of course, uh, because of the realities of Turkish domestic politics, uh, the Azerbaijanis, when they felt that their interests were being threatened, were able to stop that initiative from going forward. And in so doing, it hurt not only the process that the U.S. sought to achieve, it also hurt the regional stability and I would argue U.S. interests in the region. In fact, I would argue that the, this single initiative of the Obama administration uh, drew exactly the wrong conclusions from the Georgia war. Uh, the lessons in, in my analysis would have been we failed to avoid the escalation of something that we believed was a frozen conflict to a renewed armed conflict. Let's, the, the lesson should have been let's see what we can do to prevent that from happening in the other and in many ways much more dangerous so-called frozen conflict in the region, namely the Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict. Instead, that was explicitly put on the back burner in favor of trying to achieve a resolution to a political issue that of course is much less acute and less dangerous than the Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict. <laughs> 
Now, moving from that, if you will, that's my, my analysis of where we stand in terms of, US relation, of the U.S. relationship with the South Caucasus. Uh, let me say a few words about the challenges that we face in the region, and I would really try to, and there are many, obviously, and I'll, I'll, for the sake of our discussion today, uh, I'll just summarize them as three, in three areas. Now, the first, the first area remains and has always been, if you will, the issue of conflict resolution, and uh, the second one, I would argue, would be the external threats to the sovereignty uh, and independence of the countries, especially the efforts of R Russian reintegration of the former Soviet space. Uh, the third area, of course, is the area of internal governance and reform in the countries of the region. And very importantly, my argument is that these three areas are all related to one another, and you can't understand one in isolation from the others. Now, <clears throat> on the unresolved conflicts in the region, um, very clearly, I think these conflicts started out as intercommunal conflicts. They were not sparked by outside powers. There was always an involvement of Moscow in, in, the, uh, in the way the conflicts arose in the late uh, 1980s, but they really started out as real conflicts between the, the peoples on the ground. Uh, that, of course, had their reasons in Soviet practice and even issues before Soviet, before Soviet rule. But over time, they became, if you will, absorbed by uh, the regional dimension by the geopolitical dimension of the competition in the region. And I, uh, just to give you one example, I was once visiting Abkhazia in 2006 and uh, I met with the uh, self-proclaimed foreign minister of Abkhazia, uh, Mr. Sergei Shamba, and I, he was talking to some way about American involvement in the region and I was saying, well, isn't that quite rich for you to say when we have such a clear Russian presence in Abkhazia, and he just looked at me and said, yes, Abkhazia is a Russian protectorate and Georgia is an American protectorate. So from the point of view of very senior actors in the conflicts of the region, you see a perception that this conflict isn't really even about us anymore. It's lifted above our pay grade, it's above our heads, and therefore to resolve it, you need to resolve it at much higher levels. Obviously, specifically what we can talk about, and I think we will talk about in this conference, is the efforts by both Russia as well as Iran to manipulate uh, the conflicts in the region with a view to weaken the Western presence in the region and weaken the Western orientation uh, of the countries in the region. Certainly, that is the way Russia has been uh, approaching the South Caucasus and has been a keystone, if you will, of Russian policy in the South Caucasus, and to a lesser degree it has been so in the case of Iran. Um, Therefore, I think it's very unfortunate that we see from the West and especially from the United States a lack of interest in conflict resolution efforts. There's a fatigue, a Karabakh fatigue, if you will. Uh, but even in Georgia, there was no serious effort by the U.S. to, in, to support the Georgian government's efforts at internationalizing the mechanisms for conflict resolution before the 2008 war. And we see in general lukewarm attention to these issues. Even though the U.S. is a co-chair of the Minsk process, uh, that is tasked with resolving the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Uh, I'm happy that we, have, we will have the co-chair of the Minsk Group speaking here today because for a long time, for a number of months, the post was actually essentially vacant, which I think tells us a lot about the level of U.S. interest. And obviously what we see right now going on is very little in terms of a U.S. reaction to the very aggressive efforts by Russia to, uh, to install barbed wires on, and not only on the boundaries, administrative boundaries but of the occupation lines between South Ossetia and Georgia, but also even on Georgian territory. And moving to that, of course, it seamlessly moves us into the issues of the uh, threats to the sovereignty of the region. And I, I, earlier, I think I mentioned that the, um, the, there seems to be this idea that Europe is done, Europe is taken care of, and Eastern Europe is no longer in a sense that there's no longer any acute threats to the independence of these countries. After all, they've been there for 20 years, and you know it's more or less a fait accompli. We're not going to see 1921 happen again, which is the reintegration of these countries officially into the Soviet Union. However, what we see is that, uh, and I think um, uh, Steve Blank, who will be here, I think, today, will, uh, wrote somewhere that n nature abhors a vacuum, and that's the same thing that's happening in this region, that uh, in the because of the vacuum that is perceived in the region as a result of what they see in the region very strongly as Western disengagement, you see, of course, the very high-speed uh, efforts by uh, Vladimir Putin's administration in Russia to reintegrate the Soviet Union and the words of Hillary Clinton by other means uh, through the creation of the Customs Union and the Eurasian Union. <clears throat> 
Again, the 2008 war in Georgia was a milestone, uh, a very important event in this regard. The we what was perceived to be a weak reaction by the West uh, ushered in um, a move to an, an, an urge to move ahead on the part of the Putin administration. I think Kyrgyzstan in 2010 was another very crucial moment wh where the Russian leadership instigated and supported a coup against a, uh, a leader of a country for not having fulfilled his promise to throw out the United States from its military base at Manas. Um, by the way, that and continuous Russian pressure was what led Uzbekistan to leave the Collective Security Treaty Organization quite recently. Uh, what we see uh, in the Caucasus and what we see in, the, in, in Eastern Europe is that Russia today under Putin is no longer only opposed to NATO efforts at NATO integration in the region. They are also equally strongly opposed today to EU efforts at se setting up comprehensive free trade agreements as well as association agreements with the countries in the region. I think what happened, and you could see that when, uh, when Sergei Lavrov mentioned that the EU was trying to set up a sphere of influence in Eastern Europe, is that Russia actually realized the transformative effect in the long term of the bureaucratic institutions of the European Union. That essentially countries that would be joined to the hip with the European Union, if you will, by association agreements, would never return to being part of a Russian sphere of influence. And I think that is why, as we speak, as we sit here, you see Russian efforts in high gear to prevent uh, the countries of the region from signing, uh, initialing or signing these association agreements. Uh, unfortunately, that pressure became so s strong that the Armenian leadership um, very, very um, uh, unexpectedly, uh, the Armenian president uh, found himself compelled to join the customs union with Russia uh, at a meeting in Moscow with President Putin instead of, uh, and thereby jettisoning three years of negotiations for the, U for the association agreement with the European Union. We see similar pressure being put against Ukraine and against, um, against Moldova, and I would submit that as soon as the Olympic Games in Sochi are over, Georgia will once again fall under similar and, very, uh, and pressures of various kinds to, to follow suit. And unless Western engagement in this region uh, is revamped, I would argue that this type of, uh, this type of pressures uh, will continue and will amplify in the future. Now, um, on internal reform and governance in these issues, uh, in these countries, this is a real issue. Uh, this is a real problem. We see that, uh, it seems to me sometimes we forget that the end of the Soviet Union uh, also was in fact mainly a massive redistribution of property. Uh, transfer the transition from a command economy to a market economy. In the South Caucasus, this occurred under the conditions of war. This generated war economies and informal structures of power that we're still dealing with today in all countries of the region, Georgia to a lesser extent since they've gone through very dramatic d domestic changes. But what we're dealing with across the region is very resilient power structures across the region that are very opaque and non-transparent. And these can only be counteracted, if you will, by uh, and reformed with strong outside support. And this, if you will, is the difference between Central Europe and the former Soviet Union. The fact that the former countries got billions and, 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 and prospect of membership in, in Euro-Atlantic institutions. The countries uh, such as those in the Caucasus had neither of that uh, as support for their reform efforts. Now, uh, President Saakashvili in Georgia broke those structures, uh, but he faced also the conflict between state building and liberalization, if you will. Uh, especially in the context of the constant Russian efforts to undermine Georgia's efforts to modernize and to become a Western modern country. And I think, as he acknowledged actually in his last speech as president, I think yesterday, uh, his presidency was weakened by an emphasis of state building over uh, liberalization. Now, the reality in the region, I would argue, is that in the past five years, we continue to talk about elections and democracy as if we're in a vacuum. Uh, and what has happened, of course, is that the region has seen a gradual decline of Western engagement. And Western engagement in the security and economy of these regions, especially in their security areas, provides something that is of interest to the leaders of these countries and therefore makes them more willing to reciprocate by providing, uh, by providing changes and reforms and makes them feel the support for ch changes and reforms to their own political systems if they, are so, if they are intending to engage in that type of reform. Now, to the bewilderment of regional leaders, we criticize and pressure them on the efforts uh, 
they spend also to keep their societies secular and to prevent radicalization in their societies. Now, I will, I will certainly grant that the methods that they use are not always the ones we'd favor. But we often forget about the importance of, uh, of secular societies in protecting the rights of uh, both religious minorities as well as women. And this lack of Western engagement, and of Western engagement that appears to come mainly in the form of criticism of their domestic systems, um, opens the door to the growing mischief, if you will, of the likes of Vladimir Putin and Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. And it has tended to force the leaders of the region uh, to tighten rather than to loosen their hold on power. So if you will, my analysis would be that if you want positive changes to the internal situation of the countries in the region, you have to engage on the fundamental security issues that affect this region and, then, and the countries and that are very real. And that finally brings us to Iran uh, and a time of U.S.-Iranian negotiations that, of course, as uh, Professor Stent mentioned, must strongly affect the interests of the countries of the South Caucasus. The only question, of course, is how that will, be effect, that will affect. We know what Iran's policy in the region has been over the past 20 years. It has been very defensive, a very defensive power that is not seeking to achieve very much in the region, but is, in fact, seeking to prevent a lot more. And especially, of course, that is to prevent the expansion of Western as well as Turkish encroachment in the South Caucasus. That, in turn, leads to Iran to assail the secularism of Azerbaijan, uh, as well as the ties to Israel that several countries in the region are developing. And, if you will, a paranoia of the South Caucasus countries joining any prospective Israeli or and American uh, military strike against, against, uh, against Iran. Now, I would argue that the effect um, of the Iranian influence in the region depends uh, especially on the nature of the regime in Tehran and how that develops, not so much on the nuclear issue. The nuclear issue is fundamental from the point of view of the United States, but it's not fundamental from the point of view of the, of the countries in the region. I would argue that the fundamental issue in the region is what you could call the Azerbaijan question, namely that the major majority of the Azerbaijani nation resides in Iran rather than in the Republic of Azerbaijan. And that the Iranian state, as it is currently uh, defined, if you will, uh, and run, fears the emergence of a strong, wealthy, and secular state of Azerbaijan on its northern border. And as you can actually see, almost, uh, almost uh, like in a graph, that as the uh, country of Azerbaijan has developed economically and politically. In, in parallel with that, Iranian pressure on that country has been, uh, has been uh, mounting continuously. So when the U.S. and Iran are dancing, if you will, uh, the Caucasus is watching uh, and fearing that uh, if somehow the U.S. and Iran will resolve their main concerns, what will happen about the main concerns of the countries in the region, which again, as I say, have to do with the internal regime security and integrity of Iran as perceived by the, uh, by the clerical regime in that country. And this theme that I'm launching here, if you will, fits into the broader picture I have painted of a, a, a growing Western disengagement from the region. In other words, if you're sitting in the South Caucasus and if you feel that you're being left alone to deal with Putinism, to deal, to, to deal with Putin's reintegrative efforts, will we be left alone to deal with Rouhani? And I'll remind you that from the experience of the countries in the region, and especially Azerbaijan, of course, which has the main concerns with Iran, uh, Ahmadinejad was actually not worse than Khatami in many ways. Uh, he was more erratic. They didn't like him. But if you look at the policies towards the, Azerbaijan, the Azerbaijani population of Iran, Khatami was actually much uh, more problematic than Ahmadinejad in many ways. Um, so what we see to be the differences uh, for our purposes in, Ira in Iran's leadership don't affect the South Caucasus the same way. So in conclusion, I would only conclude by, by calling really for a return of the basic principles that formed the basis for U.S. engagement with this region from the early 1990s for the better part of, of two decades. Uh, which is a, uh, a policy that begins with the support for the sovereignty, uh, independence, and integrity of the countries in the region. And this is, again, not about resources. The Caucasus has its own resources, and the Europeans have resources. This is about leadership. This is about political leadership, not about the scarce resources that this country has right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll sit here.
Thank you very much. That was an extremely informative and uh, rich um, summary and analysis of what's happening in the region. So we do have some time for questions. Um, and do we have, we have microphones, I guess, right in the back there. So questions. Let's see if anybody has a question. It's very bright. <laughs> it is bright. <laughs> OK. Um, let me disagree with the final statement. Um, it is about resources. Do you want to stand up? OK. Sorry, well, I wanted standing. to read a couple of things from the computer. So oh, OK. So I'll make All it uh, difficult. All right. But it is about it. Yeah, you know, I was a student here during Vietnam. It takes resources. If you make promises to people, you need resources to back them up, or the promises are worthless. What are the resources? Recently, um, the Chief of Staff of the uh, Army sent a, me a memo, quote, let there be no mistake, aggregate reductions will take place, the money is gone. What can you promise to people? He told, he told the division commanders, 25% reductions, and that's now. Moreover, the American people are tired. You mentioned 1990, it's not 1990 anymore. We have had 20 years of war. And this is, to keep the question within some constraint, the mother and army soldier who made multiple deployments to Iraq. This is the quote. I am sick in my stomach about this new war. This was when we were contemplating strikes on Syria. And don't trust anybody in Washington. I have seen the pain in the eyes of too many Gold Star families and am just too war weary. I don't think I was this anxious when my son was deployed. I had faith then, unquote. That is the sentiment of the mother of a soldier who was deployed. How can you make promises to other people if you cannot back them up? OK, thanks. All right, do you want to? This yeah, the no, question. I mean, the d d increasing disinclination in this country mm -hmm. to getting involved uh, and staying involved in regions like the one we're discussing. Well, I think, I, I frankly don't understand the relevance of the question. We are, nobody is talking about deployment of U.S. troops in the South Caucasus. What we're talking about here really is a policy that if you want to look at what, what, what were the costs of the policy of the United States in the South Caucasus and Central Asia in the 90s and 2000s, the only cost I can really think of was the Exim Bank's credits that helped support the building of the Bakut Tbilisi Jehan pipeline. But that didn't even turn out to be a cost because that pipeline is, very, is, is making money quite well, thank you. What, what, what I'm talking about is the need for political leadership and clarity. What the problem is, I think the main problem, you, you refer to Syria and the Middle East. I mean, the, the way I look at it, I'm not an expert on that region. Uh, give me a policy where a president says from the beginning either I am, we have certain interest in this, uh, in this country and therefore I will act accordingly or we have no interest and therefore let the guys in the, in the region sort it out. But the lack of clarity and the lack of leadership and the vacillation of policy is, is, is what's the problem. To take one very concrete example, this is the first time that we don't have a U.S. Uh, a high a position of a U.S. representative dealing with the issues of Caspian energy. Every administration previously has had that. Okay, that's resources. That's one job in the State Department or reporting to the Secretary of State and to the President. Yes, that's resources. But I don't think that's the kind of resources you're talking about. I think if you have, if you have clarity and if you have, uh, for example, simply the fact that U.S. officials would, would reiterate again that they support and they consider important the sovereignty and independence of the countries in the South Caucasus and Central Asia, that would make a lot of difference. We don't hear that anymore. That's the problem. What we hear is that we treasure, we, we hear the president saying off mic that he will have more flexibility in his second term to Dmitry Medvedev. Please tell Vladimir. These are the things we're hearing. That's the problem. This is not about resources. It's not even, you mentioned promises. This is not about promises. It's, Georgia never got, never expected a promise that the U.S. would support them militarily uh, in, in, in the war, in, in any military confrontation with Russia. What we expect is that there will be from the European side and from the American side a certain policy of holding the line on what we consider acceptable behavior by other major partners. We haven't seen that. 
the ceasefire treaty with, with the, uh, that the Russians accepted that ended the war in Georgia is not being fulfilled. Russia is constantly in violation of that. And we see Western policymakers basically ignoring that problem. And we're seeing again, as I already mentioned, that the position of the co-chair of the Minsk group to negotiate the, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict was vacant practically. They, these are not issues of promises. These are not issues of resources. These are issues of leadership and attention. Thank you very much. I'm Andra Nikolvanistan, Embassy of Armenia. Mr. Cornell, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, as you rightly mentioned, there is a dance ongoing in South Caucasus, but I don't think it's a tango between the United States and Iran. I think there are more participants in this dance, and you know very well that then uh, elephants are dancing, grass suffers. Uh, my question will be related to the U.S. interest in South Caucasus, as you eloquently elaborated. But uh, let's, for a moment, put aside the energy interest in South Caucasus or transit interest. What else, what other interests may United States have in South Caucasus? If you, well, for one moment, we, um, uh, we imagine that there are no energy and transit uh, issues. Are there any other uh, interests? And just to add that certainly, uh, uh, there are several issues on which I disagree with you on um, points you mentioned on Armenia, but I respect your point of view. I would not dwell upon them. Thank you. Well, thank you. We, we, we can discuss them later, I hope. Um, uh, as for the, I think actually that the, the U.S., the, the energy issues are not a primary interest to the United States in the region. Uh, energy is instrumental from the point of view, and that's the way the Clinton administration envisaged energy, was as instrumental in supporting the sovereignty and independence of the region. Actually, interestingly, I once met a, a very high official in the, uh, in the energy directorate of the European Commission, a Frenchman who was telling me that, oh, you know, when the Baku Jehan, this was in the late 90s, when the Baku Jehan pipeline will be built, the Americans will bring super tankers to Jehan and they get all the Caspian oil and take it to America. <laughs> That hasn't happened, you know. It, it, the U.S. doesn't even, I don't even know if the U.S. gets any of this oil. But the U.S. supported the, pi the multiple pipeline policy, uh, not partly because American companies w were involved, but the real issue was this was a vehicle and an instrument to support sovereignty and independence. And that is uh, what I think uh, was the main, uh, the main concern. Now, from a strategic and long-term perspective, what you see here is that the, the early... In the early 1990s, the U.S. was faced with the opportunity of establishing a presence in very strategically located areas in the heart of the Eurasian continent. And in that sense, the Caucasus has a value of its own, uh, which, of course, Americans uh, of all stripes discovered after 9-11 when we needed to fly in uh, you know, resources and material to the war in Afghanistan. And what we found is that the, the South Caucasus became the transit corridor for much of this. Now, what we're seeing in, in addition is the South Caucasus being transformed into a, a commercial corridor as well, a civilian commercial corridor, both east and west and in the future, I hope, also north-south, where Armenia will uh, so far has, in the east-west, the transportation has not been able to be part of it for, for reasons that we all know, but where Armenia hopefully in the future will also be part. But the broader, the broader vision I think is if you look at the map, you see that the South Caucasus is, uh, to begin with, a, a transit corridor, uh, the access point, if you will, of the connection between the West and the Eurasian continent, between Europe and the heart of the Eurasian continent. And therefore, you can think of it in terms of, and I think for the South Caucasus in the long term, uh, the Suez Canal, believe it or not, is actually a, a, a model that uh, the Suez Canal, because of the tra trade going through the Suez Canal, is so strategic for so many disparate private and public uh, forces that nobody really could mess with it without incurring a very high cost. And in the not too distant future, I think it's realistic for the South Caucasus to become a kind of a land Suez, if you will. Fred Starr, the chairman of our institute, has kind of developed this, this term, if you will. A land corridor that is so important that nobody will want, that, that the cost for anybody of messing or creating trouble in this corridor will be so high that nobody will want to do that, and that will stabilize the region. But for the, for the West, I think the primary the primary interest for the United States is that through the South Caucasus you get access to small countries 
uh, that are, because of their own size, if you will, and their position, are, have a strong vested interest in a strong relationship with America, and which provides in turn the U.S. with a, with, with a, uh, with a, with a presence in this very strategic region, which until, you know, uh, 20 years ago, there simply wasn't a U.S. presence at all. Okay. Yes, over there. Uh, good morning. Uh, Yusuf Mabon Lee, Azerbaijan State Telegraph Agency. Uh, as, uh, as you mentioned already, uh, separatism is a big issue uh, uh, in Caucasus, uh, you have Abkhazia, Sassetia, and Nagorno-Karabakh. And uh, to the west of Armenia, Armenia occupies 20% of Azerbaijan territory. To the east, it claims the territory of Azerbaijan, Nakhchivan, and uh, part of Turkey. In fact, uh, President Sarkisyan was quoted uh, saying in front of the Armenian audience that, you know, we've done our job, we've taken Nagorno-Karabakh. It's your job for the next generation to uh, get the Turkish territory. Uh, and I understand that uh, part of the political concept called Greater Armenia also involves some portion of the Iranian territory. Uh, the question is, why hasn't Armenia laid claims to Iranian territory so far? Is it because of the uh, isolation that it has with other countries and it's kind of a route to survival? Or, uh, in other words, uh, what is Yerevan waiting for? Thank you. I'm quite frankly at a loss how to answer your question. I mean, you forgot Georgia, by the way. Uh, no, I mean, I think uh, the, um, uh, the, the reality is that, uh, that whatever motives you attribute to the, to the leadership of Armenia, uh, the fact is that, that Armenia has, uh, you know, the, the war with Azerbaijan was quite sufficient. <laughs> if you will, for, 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 the, for anybody in Armenia. And I think the, the problem now is to, from, from the perspective of the leadership in Armenia, is to maintain whatever gains were made rather than to, uh, rather than to involve in any other adventures in the region. I mean, in especially, I, I remember in the, in the 1990s when the question of Javakheti in Georgia was, was very much up on the agenda, when there was a lot of unrest in Javakheti in the early 1990s. And you will recall that the Armenian government actually intervened to prevent the escalation of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, a, of a conflict in Javakheti. And I think simply because the Armenian leadership realized that there was no way Armenia could handle another conflict on its, on its northern border. Uh, but um, but I, think, uh, I think we should focus really on the issues that are, that are, that are at the center of the, of the conference's uh, uh, theme. Other questions? The one right there. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, I'm Gabriel Balayan. I'm a Fulbright visiting scholar at the Law Library. And my question is about uh, uh, our region. Actually, two countries, by the U.S. and by the uh, European Union, they were recognized. They, were, uh, they, were, they are going far with the election system, with the improving election system. And in case of Azerbaijan, during the last elections, all the observers, you know, they just registered the backward. So what is the view, uh, U.S. views or your, uh, your own view on this issue about this? You told uh, that Azerbaijan was developing economically and politically. Uh, I, I want to consider whether there is a political development if you have an election uh, system backward. Yeah, I think uh, we, we can argue about wh what direction elections are going in all of these countries with the possible exception of Georgia. But in Georgia, we have also a very strange situation where we have the a president being elected and a prime minister soon nominated solely on the basis of that Mr. Ivanishvili has nominated them. So that's also a very strange situation that is where maybe, you know, Georgia had, and that, that goes towards answering your question, that in political development is much more than elections. I think elections are very often hyped in the West because it's a very media-friendly uh, event, so to speak, whereas the real work of build, building state institutions and democracy uh, lie not in the realm of elections but in building this, the rule of law, uh, issues where all of these three countries have very serious problems. Now, regarding uh, 
regarding Azerbaijan, just like any other country, I think what I, I alluded to my perspective on this in my earlier remarks when I said that I think the, the issues of internal reform and of governance in these countries don't occur in a vacuum. Uh, in, uh, in, in a, you could actually make an interesting contrast between Georgia and Azerbaijan in this regard, where Mr. Saakashvili was feeling, you know, similarly, he, on the one side, he, he, he had a strong urge to maximize control over society because of the real as well as perceived threats, mixed threats from the outside and the inside, where I think to the Georgian leadership, it wasn't really clear who the enemy was. I mean, Russia was there, but who among the Georgian political class were actually working with or somehow for the Russians, it was, even they didn't really know. And so on the one hand, they had this, this, this urge, which we saw in many ways, of maximizing control over society. Uh, but on the other hand, they also knew that th th their only way that they could uh, escape from the Russian uh, shadow, if you will, was through further democratization. And therefore, you saw Mr. Saakashvili basically accepting defeat in elections. Uh, Azerbaijan has had the same challenges, I think. You, you see in, in the past two years, what you see, for example, is um, uh, first the, uh, the, the decision by, of course, very strongly increasing Iranian pressure on Azerbaijan. Secondly, uh, Mr. Putin organizing the, uh, the oligarchs, the Azerbaijani origin oligarchs in, in, in Russia under his control uh, and, uh, and basically threatening, if you will, what the Azerbaijanis call an Ivanishvili scenario with the, uh, with the uh, somewhat unfairly, uh, with uh, you know, people with, who made their money in Russia starting to interfere in the elections and creating violence and what have you. Uh, and that comes, of course, from the Azerbaijani perspective after the Arab Spring, after the Turkish-Armenian rapprochement supported by the U.S., after the war in Georgia, and many events that rocked the foundations of the foreign policy and the stability of the country. And I think, uh, whether you like it or not, the, the, the response of the Azerbaijani government has, to be, has been very much the same that Mr. Saakashvili felt but didn't really fully move on, which was we have to establish control. We cannot afford further liberalization at this point. Uh, that would be my answer to your question. And I think only, uh, on the other hand, if you talk about political development, I mean, I think people had great expectations that Ilham Aliyev would engage in reform because of the different generation and education he had compared to his father. Uh, some, a lot of people have been disappointed, I would say, by, by the very slow pace of reform. Uh, but I, I would say that my point has always been that the, the problem, if you look at all the transfer, changes of personnel that Mr. Aliyev has made, for example, they've all been positive. They just haven't been enough. And I'll just call your attention to the fact that just in the uh, last few months, we saw first, the, we, we've seen the replacement of two of the most uh, I don't want to use the word odious, but uh, two of the mo old school, you know, Soviet era figures, the Minister of Education, and now with the recent election, after the election, the Minister of Defense have been replaced uh, by people of a different generation. I don't know who the, the new defense minister personally, but if you look at the Ministry of Education, you have a new minister who is trained in the New York Bar, a U.S. trained the Minister of Education. Will he be able to conduct reforms? We will have to see. But um, I think while you, so to speak, electorally can see, you can argue that there was a step backwards, there have been other things that have been positive at the same time. Well, I think, okay, time for one more question. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Fakhradin Ismailov. I'm from the Embassy of Azerbaijan. Uh, I don't want to, to see Dr. Cornell leave in the room without asking my question on, on your book uh, regarding Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan since independence, there's a chapter devoted to our Azerbaijan's relation to, with Iran. And th the conclusions of this chapter um, ends, uh, t according to my reading, on a pessimistic notes and they somehow the, uh, call on Azerbaijan to be prepared for some worst, worst case scenarios. Is, is my reading is, uh, not correct or is it correct? What, what uh, kind of plausible <coughs> scenarios that mm. You may, you may describe on, in case for, for coming years real, uh, on relation between Iran and Azerbaijan. Um, also, using this that I have the floor, I was just um, comments the question of uh, our Armenian friends. Uh, that he, he asked the question of Azerbaijan elections, implicitly uh, claiming that Armenian elections were better than Azerbaijanis. But I will invite all our colleagues to take a look on the final reports of OEC, which is where you will see that these elections were not better than ours. And 
in case that you have the candidate being shot down and then you have the, another candidate uh, that claiming that elections were, were uh, uh, was not conducted in a due way and claim organizing rallies in a way that you shouldn't have I mean the, the first you should deal with elections in Armenia before taking any assessments on the in the neighboring countries. Thank you very much in advance for your reply to my question. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe we had um, a question over the it's table right with there, Professor yeah. Schaffer's class. Does someone have a question? Yes. Uh, my name is Greg Miller. I'm a student here at Georgetown. Uh, my question is, you said that after the fall of the Soviet Union, there was a uh, kind of violent transition, not, maybe not violent transition, but transition from command to market economies, but that in the South Caucasus, a lot of this transition happened in the context of war economies. And I was um, wondering if you could comment further on the kind of long-term effects of the development in a war economy versus just the regular transition that other post-Soviet states kind of experience. Thank you. I don't think I really have time to answer these questions, but I'll try. Uh, I'll first ask both my friends from Armenia and Azerbaijan to, to take their disputes on the courtyard. You know, it <laughs> would do us all a favor. Um, on, uh, my, the, the, on the question of the Iran and Azerbaijan, I, I'll have to go back and see what I wrote, frankly. But what I think I alluded to is the fact that the, um, the big, one of, the, actually the biggest question for Azerbaijan as a state in the future, I think, is the future of Iran, because it is the only, Iran's relationship with Azerbaijan is really the only existential threat to Azerbaijan, I would argue. Uh, Azerbaijan, in its current shape as a state, could only really be altered uh, by the future of Iran. If there is, for example, you know, the worst case scenario, I think, would be a, a collapse of Iran along ethnic lines. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily likely, but the very fact that this is, would, can be a possibility um, that Iran, just like the Soviet Union, would be, so to speak, fissuring and fracturing around eth ethnic lines and that you would have ethnic strife in Iran. That I, I can't see how Azerbaijan could stay out of that if, you know, the uh, whole northwest of Azerbaijan would be, so to speak, involved in ethnic, uh, all the Azerbaijanis in Iran would be involved in ethnic strife in Iran. And that would, inf you know, even if Azerbaijan as a state wouldn't want to be involved, it would be extremely difficult to stay out of that type of conflict. I think that's really what I alluded to in terms of the future of Iran looming, if you will, over, over, uh, over, over Azerbaijan. Um, on the issue of a transition uh, at the time of war, I think what I meant is, you know, in all of these economies, uh, I mean, you, you looked at Russia, you saw the Khodorkovskys and the Berezovskys and the Gusinskys accumul basically accumulating, grabbing assets that they turned into valuable property and built fortunes. Uh, in most countries of the former Soviet Union, you saw what you could call a, a, a union of political and economic power. That is, the people in political power were also able to grab assets, uh, either in their own names or in the names of their wives or children or, or what have you. Uh, and that was, you know, when you have massive pri privatization, it happened in an unfair way, in an unequal way, and that's just the way it happened. Um, this was aggravated, I think, in, in the South Caucasus by the fact that it happened during war. Take the example of Rasul Guliev, who is living in New York, former Azerbaijani Speaker of Parliament, who was who was running the oil refineries in, outside of Baku, and he realized in the transition that he really didn't have to send the money onwards to anybody in Moscow or anywhere else. So while refining oil, he just kept the money for himself and accumulated a huge fortune. And this happened all across the place. And because, uh, you know, in, in the South Caucasus, the macroeconomic stabilization programs, the, the building of more or less accountable or often less accountable institutions, wasn't the first priority of the governments because their first priority was prosecuting wars. And that affected their ability to build any kind of institution that organized the way in which property was, so to speak, divided and, and disseminated in society. And I think that's why you see property division or property, uh, you know, uh, you, you, see, you saw the emergence of informal structures of power with large scale control over various sectors of the economy in the South Caucasus to an extent that is um, worse than in many other countries. Well, I think we um, heard several important messages from you. I think some of the most important are that the West has to remain involved, the US and Europe, but it's going to be increasingly challenging to keep them involved. And if they don't remain involved, then uh, the consequences, you know, we, we will regret the consequences as we go forward. Please join me in thanking Svante Cornell for a very interesting